Thanks, Trav. Our Bible reading tonight is taken from the uh, letter to the Corinthians, second letter to the Corinthians, at chapter 8. We're reading the first nine verses. So the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Evening, everyone. How are you going? There we go. Hello. Welcome to church. I'm a bit shorter than whoever's service leading, so I'm going to move that down a little bit. Uh, my name is Mark, if I haven't met you. Uh, it's great to have you here tonight. Uh, we're finishing off our sermon series Uh, thinking about God's mission and how that shapes our mission. Uh, It's my privilege to be finishing that off tonight. As Rod has already suggested, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is how we get involved in God's mission. Uh, So let's pray. We're going to need God's help tonight. uh, And uh, let's uh, do that before we dig into the Bible. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the grace that you've shown to us in the Lord Jesus. Thanks that it's because of him that we exist as a church, we exist as your people, because you have called us into your kingdom by faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, Thanks, Father, that we get to relate to you as a father. We get to talk to you in prayer, and we get to hear you speaking to us by your spirit through your word. So please bless our time together now as we listen to your voice in the words of scripture, and give us ears to hear, and give us faith to obey. We ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Uh, There's a a famous story uh, from the early 20th century of an explorer uh, by the name of Ernest Shackleton. Uh, Ernest Shackleton wanted to put a crew together to cross the Antarctic. He was going on a major mission. And so what Ernest Shackleton did was he placed an ad in some newspapers in London to try and do some recruiting. This is the ad that he placed. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, Long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honour and recognition in event of success. It's a great ad, isn't it? Wonderful ad. I used to work in recruitment before I became a pastor, so I used to put like ad, help wanted ads in papers all the time. Can I say, I would never write an ad like this if I was trying to get people to come and join my cause, but Ernest Shackleton did. And the amazing thing about it was the response that he had to this ad. Uh, as the story goes, some 5,000 men approached Ernest Shackleton and contacted him and said that they wanted to be a part of the expedition to cross the Antarctic. 5,000 men who couldn't wait to pay this price, to get on board, to make these kind of sacrifices to join in this amazing adventure, this amazing mission that Shackleton was going on. Now, there are questions about whether that story is actually true or not. History is still debating it. Uh, But what I love about this story, whether it's true or not, is that it shines a light, I think, on us as Christians as we think about our response to God's invitation to join his mission, his grand plan that he's engaging in in this world. Uh, Because God's grand plan, when you think about it, God's mission, it is so much greater than simply crossing the Antarctic, isn't it? 
this, this grand mission that God invites us to, to know Christ and make him known, to make disciples who make disciples. That is a far bigger and a far more important mission than just crossing an icy continent, isn't it? God has called every single one of us to come and die, to come and die and pick up our cross and follow the crucified Saviour through this life on the narrow path as exiles and pilgrims towards our heavenly home. And he has said that as we walk this path following our Saviour Jesus, our job is to sing his praises and to tell the world to come and join us, to join us and find rescue and salvation and to be safe from the coming wrath. That mission is so much greater than just crossing the Antarctic. And so our response, don't you agree, should be so much greater than those 5,000 men who couldn't wait to join Ernest Shackleton. We should be so much more eager to join, so much more ready to pay whatever price it is that God will have us pay in order to take part in God's mission, in order to resource God's mission. That is the topic that we're thinking about today. How do we resource God's mission? What is our response to this invitation that God has extended to us to participate in this great work, to know Christ and make him known? That's what we're going to be thinking about. And as we're going to do, uh, as we have done for the last couple of weeks, tonight we're going to uh, do the sermon a little bit differently. There's going to be two kind of shorter sermons rather than one longer sermon. There'll be a break in the middle so you can get some respite. But what I want to do with the first kind of 10 or 15 minutes or so is just to kind of remind you guys, as we approach this question of our, res- our resourcing of God's mission, what I want to do is remind you of some truths that you probably already know. Truths about why we should resource God's mission. That's the, the kind of the foundation that we are going to start with. And it's important that we start there before we then, in the second talk, think about, well, how then do we actually resource God's mission? We've got to get the foundation right first. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Why should we resource God's mission? And I've got two, two answers to that question for you, two reasons why we should resource God's mission. Uh, the first reason might seem like a strange one, But it's this, it's that we are obligated to because all our resources are actually God's. We're obligated to resource God's mission because all our resources are actually God's in the first place. Now, uh, there's a truth behind this, which I think is perhaps so blindingly obvious that many of us just tend to overlook it. It's so fundamental to biblical faith that we kind of take it for granted and probably sometimes forget it a little bit. Uh, And so what I want to do is just refresh your memory of something that I hope you all agree with, and it's this. It's that God made everything, and therefore God owns everything. God made everything, and therefore God owns everything. Now, if you think about it, you start at the very first page of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and that is the truth that Genesis chapter 1 is screaming at you. God made everything, and God owns everything. Genesis chapter 1 is structured in a way to make you see, it's unmissable, that God owns everything. Everything in creation, the, the, the complete extremities of creation and everything in between. He is the God of the light and the darkness. He is the God of the sun and the moon and the stars. He is the God of the sky, but also the God of the land and the sea. He's the God of the plants. He's the God of the animals. He's the God of humanity. The point that that is saying is that God owns everything everything in the universe. And if if you were an ancient reader of Genesis chapter 1, you would read that and that would just seem so strange to you because the time that that was written in, some three, 4,000 years ago, all the other ancient cultures around Israel didn't believe anything close to that. All the ancient cultures around Israel had had a, a whole plethora of gods, a whole group of gods, and each god had its own little domain of responsibility. There was a sun god, there was an agriculture god, there was a fertility god. And Genesis chapter 1 comes along and it says, no, 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 no. The God who made everything, made everything. There's not many gods who look after lots of different things. There's one God and his dominion is everything that you see. Uh, There's a very famous quote by a theologian called Abraham Kuyper. Maybe you've heard of it before. Uh, The quote is this, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Every atom in the universe, every second that has ticked on every clock in the whole history of the universe, it belongs to God. To God. It is God's. He owns it because he made it. 
Now, it's pretty easy to forget that, I think. Uh, to forget that God owns everything. I think we tend to actually slip into this way of thinking where we assume that the stuff in our lives is actually ours, that it's, that it's mine. And that's a crazy thing to believe, right? Uh, my, this has sort of come home to me recently because my three-year-old daughter, she's about to turn three, she's just reached this phase of life where she's starting to be really possessive of stuff. And so uh, if you have something that she thinks is hers or that should be hers or she would like to be hers... Uh, and then she will let you know about it. She'll come up to you and she will grab it and she'll say, it's mine, give it to me. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's you know, food or clothes or toys, even if it's my other child, uh, my boy, Silas, who's three months old, uh, Alyssa thinks she owns him. And so if Alyssa and Silas are playing together and we have to go and put Silas to bed, Alyssa's not happy about that. She'll say, no, he's my brother. He's mine. Don't take him from me. She, that's crazy, isn't it? She thinks she owns this this child, she doesn't own Silas. She doesn't own anything in life. All that stuff that she says it's mine, she didn't earn it. She didn't buy it. She was given it. Literally, everything in my daughter's realm of existence has been given to her. It's such an ugly thing to think, isn't it? To say, this is mine when it's not yours. That is an ugly way of thinking, an ugly way of behaving. But you know, that is exactly what we do, isn't it? That's the trap of thinking that we fall into. We think, oh, no, that savings account, that's mine. That's my money, God. Keep your hands off. Those, those friendships, they're my friendships. God, keep your nose out of them. Uh, no, God, this is my free time. I've clocked off now. You don't have ownership over my free time, God. It's mine. That's a mistake. And we would do well to remember that... Uh, God actually has a greater claim on our stuff than we do. Uh, You know, all of our possessions, all of our time, all of our resources, all of our assets, everything we have, it's all God's. We just happen to be holding on to it for a while. That's what's going on there. You know, if if you search through the Bible, you will not find a single verse in Scripture that suggests that God has relinquished ownership to you or to me or to anyone else. God owns everything. And so this question, the first question that we're thinking about, well, why should I give my resources to help support God's mission? Do you see that that question, when you word it like that, it's completely the wrong question to be asking. They're not our resources in the first, time, first place, are they? They're God's resources because he made them. He owns them. And so God gets to decide how they're used. I'll try and frame it for you like this. Imagine that you start a new job and your employer uh, gives you a work laptop for you to do your work for him on. And you say, oh, great, thanks for this, really appreciate it. I'm just going to go and use this as a doorstop now. You wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't say, oh, thanks for the laptop. I'll just, I think I'll decide to use it as a serving tray. That'd be great. That's, that's my choice. I'm going to do that. No, you don't get that choice, do you? It's not your resource. It's your employer's resource, and it's to be used for his purposes. That is exactly what is going on with all the stuff in our lives. It's not ours, it's God's. We're obligated to use it for his, resource, for his mission because it belongs to him. That is the first answer to our question of why we should resource God's mission. But it's not the only answer. In fact, it's probably the, the lesser of the two answers that we're going to think about tonight because it's not just that we should give our resources to God's mission, is it? If you're a Christian here tonight... It's hopefully also that you want to give your resources to God's mission. If you are a gospel person who has understood the grace that God has shown to you in the Lord Jesus, then you are going to be somebody who's inspired to to give and to sacrifice and to support and to resource the work that God is doing in the world. You are going to give everything that you can to support God's work. Why? Because as a gospel person, you know how much God has generously shared with you. Have you thought about this? How much God has shared with you? God has shared this amazing creation with us that he invites us to live in rent-free, right? God has shared his image with us. He has stamped us with his divine image. We alone in all of creation get to be image bearers of God. God has shared with us every good gift that we have in our life. The Bible says every good thing has come to you from the hand of God. God has shared immensely with us, but you know what he shared more than all? The best thing that God has shared with us. God has shared with us 
his only son, the Lord Jesus. You know, even when we had made ourselves God's enemies, God's son came and shared our flesh and blood. He took our sin on his shoulders. He took our shame and our disgrace. God the Son even shared in our experience of death so that we wouldn't have to. It's, it's incredible. It's really unfathomable, unfathomable to get your head around how a creator would share so generously with his rebellious creatures. But that is the God that we serve. He has shown us grace upon grace. He has given us, his enemies, redemption through crushing his only eternal son. Isn't that staggering? It is the best gift that God has given us. And he has shared it with us completely freely. But you know, that that gift, it doesn't just stop there with kind of like a clean slate. God gives us more of Jesus, doesn't he? Jesus shares his righteousness with us. He shares his spirit with us to come and dwell within us. He shares his eternal inheritance with us. Romans 8 even says that God goes so far as to share his glory with us. Can you get your head around that? And so, friends, can I just say that what this means, putting these these two halves of the puzzle together, it means that our lives belong to God twice over, right? We belong to God by virtue of the fact that we're created beings. We are his. He breathed life into us. Everything we have belongs to him. We belong to him for that reason, but also because because he's purchased us through the precious blood of his son. We are God's twice over. And, And it's that gospel grace, that sharing of his son with us, that is what should inspire us as Christians to give and to share and to sacrifice and to resource for God's mission. Because if you understand God's grace, then you will want to use everything that you have to make God famous, to see his kingdom extended, to see his church built up. Uh, I want to introduce you to a guy named James Harrison. This is James Harrison. He's 78 years old. He lives on the central coast in New South Wales. And um, when James Harrison was younger, Uh, He had a very bad medical condition that required surgery, and he had to have a lung taken out at the age of 14. And so when he went in for this surgery some 60-odd years ago, there was a complication, and he had to have an emergency blood transfusion. And as a result of this transfusion, uh, getting all this new blood pumped into his body, he actually developed a very rare antibody in his blood. And this antibody in his blood is so special that doctors use this antibody to create a vaccine called Anti-D, which is used to treat pregnant women who suffer from the very rare rhesus disease. Uh, I want to read you a quote that James Harrison said about this experience. He says, When I came out of the operation, or a couple of days after, my father was explaining what had happened. He said I'd received 13 litres of blood, and my life had been saved by by unknown people. He, he's referring to his father, he was a donor himself. So I said, when I'm old enough... I'll become a blood donor. And he did when James Harrison grew up. Over the course of 60 years, he has given blood over 1,000 times. And that very special antibody in his blood has been used to create a vaccine that has saved the lives of over 2 million Australian babies over the last 60 years. Probably some people in this room owe their life to James Harrison and the antibody in his blood. You see, what happened for James Harrison was that he received something incredibly precious something completely free and it saved his life and he was transformed to be somebody who just wanted to give and give and give as much as he could in response. Friends, can I say that that is exactly the same thing that the gospel does to us, right? It's exactly the same thing. I want to show you a couple of places in the New Testament uh, that highlight this kind of dynamic of receiving the grace of God, transforming us to be people who give blessing to others. Okay, I want to show you a couple of places just to prove I'm not making this up. This is uh, 1 John chapter 3. John is writing to these Christians, trying to encourage them to uh, show care and concern for one another. And so this is what he writes. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Do you see see there in that first verse the 
the gospel connection, the gospel dynamic, how the gospel is supposed to have changed these people. They have experienced the sacrificial love of God and now they are to go out and love sacrificially, care for others sacrificially. You've received grace, now give. That's the dynamic. You've received grace, now give. I'll show you another place. The, the reading that we had read out for us by Eric earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Here, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians and he's telling them about a money collection that has taken place uh, by some Macedonian Christians, who've uh, Gentiles, who've put a whole bunch of money together to go and give it to the Jerusalem Christians who are suffering because of a famine. And so Paul uh, tells them here you know, in verse 3, For I testify that they, the Macedonians, gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Just stop there. Isn't that an incredible snapshot? Talking about people so eager to give, they're pleading for the privilege of giving financially to help support their brothers and sisters. What could possibly have led to that kind of a dramatic transformation in, in their lives? How could they possibly want to be so generous? Well, he tells us the answer in verse 9 there, the second half of that bottom paragraph. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Do you get it? He's saying God gave it all for you. Even though God was rich, he became poor so that you in your poverty might experience the riches of Christ. You have become rich in Christ and now give. That's the dynamic here. You've received grace, now give. You've received grace, now give. Support, sacrifice, resource God's mission with everything that you've got. And so this is where I want to kind of draw the, the conclusion of this first talk here. And I just want to help you to see the foundation here that we as Christians have a double reason to resource God's mission. Yes, because we are obligated to, because everything we own belongs to God in the first place. But more importantly than that, because of the gospel, we are inspired to give. And so let me ask you this evening, how does that sit with you? Are you somebody that has been gripped by the gospel? Are you somebody who, who is pleading for the opportunity to partner in the work that God is doing, being willing to give anything that you can to God's work in the world? Has that gripped you? Have you understood you've received grace and now you are to give? Maybe one way of thinking about it would be to imagine as if God himself had placed one of those uh, ad-wanted uh, signs in the newspaper. God's ad, what would it say? All wanted for life or death mission. Hard work, much sacrifice, retirement only upon death, safe arrival guaranteed, joy and commendation upon completion. The question for us tonight is, will you join that mission? Well, this is our pause um, in the sermon, and part two will happen in a moment. And in between, I'm going to interview Grace Jones as we think about this theme of serving, um, giving of ourselves generously. Um, in doing so, we're launching the series handbook uh, for this term, uh, term one, which will uh, cover Luke 6 to 9, which is what we're about to launch into next week. Uh, there'll be copies out available in the foyer afterwards. Um, a lot of time has gone into preparing this because... There's a number of factors to it, and so we're going to hear a little bit more about it now. So I invite Grace to come up and uh, share with us. So how did you assist in um, putting this together, Grace? What was your part in this grand scheme? Um, so my role was a little bit um, undefined and a little bit tricky. Um, this booklet's going to be really awesome, though. Um, it's gonna, it contains a whole bunch of stuff um, that a lot of people have contributed to. Um, my contribution was a little bit more on the fringes. Um, so this guide um, is going to include stuff um, for home groups and for personal uh, Bible reading um, and for sermon note-taking and things. Uh, and my job was kind of to do something creative, I guess, that was um, sort of helped us to think through certain ideas that we're going to come across in the next couple of weeks and months, um, maybe from a different angle. Um, so that looks like... I didn't really know what for a while. Um, 
things like um, articles, poetry, um, uh, ultimately it'll hopefully include like interviews and things like that. Um, this time round, um, I've written a couple of things. Um, I've also created a couple of playlists for you to um, listen to as we think through um, a couple of different topics um, throughout this series that we're about to start. So with Spotify playlists and all kinds of things there, um, why would you um, spend this time and energy to put towards it? Like we're, we're all busy in different ways in our lives. Uh, why serve in this manner? What motivated you to get involved? Um, firstly, I think this is just a really cool idea um, and it's, I think, a really um, hopefully going to be really helpful um, for all of us as we start this new series. Um, Secondly, it was just kind of cool to be able to um, try something new, to um, see that opportunity and go, oh, I, I think I can contribute to that, even if I'm not quite sure how well I can contribute to that, but I'm going to um, give it a red hot go. Um, but kind of more broadly speaking, I guess, is that um, as a Christian, I believe that um, my whole life's purpose is to delight in God um, not just on a Sunday, but throughout the week, um, and to help others um, do that too. And so this was just a really small way of, um, I guess, trying to build up the church and help kind of point them to Jesus and help them to delight in him as well. Uh, thanks, Grace. Well, um, I hope that you get hold of Wonder Night and you use it not only in your home group, but as you would have gathered then, it's multifaceted. So it has daily Bible readings that you can use personally. It has opportunities um, for discipleship of your family, so uh, devotional times for your family. It's also got room for sermon notes. So the idea is that you'll bring it Sunday by Sunday and you've got room to scroll down notes if you're a note taker as well. So um, keep that in mind and grab one afterwards. Thanks, Mark. All right, part two. So assuming now we've laid the theological foundation for why we should resource God's mission, the question that we hopefully all want to know the answer to then is, well, okay, I'm, I'm on board, I want to contribute, how do I do that? What does it look like to resource God's mission? Now, uh, what I want to share with you now is kind of two key ways that you can be involved this year in helping resource God's mission, in seeing that mission of knowing Christ, making him known, advance here at WBC. Uh, as I do talk about these, though, just to sort of preface this, this is really aimed at those of you who are regulars and, and who call WBC your home. If you're new here today, if you're visiting us, we're stoked to have you, uh, but this is not actually directly aimed at you. Uh, and so you can listen in on this, and it'll be helpful for you because it will show you what life at WBC is like and what we as Christians commit ourselves to. But please don't feel like I'm trying to, to push this on you. If you're a regular here, though, I am trying to push this on you. Okay, that's... That's my uh, provision. Right, so two key ways that we can resource God's mission. The first of those is by serving, uh, by serving God's mission. Uh, one of the, the key things that we do as Christians to help God's, if you like, the, that gospel ball to advance down the field is by giving our time and our energy and our gifts and our skills to labor and to serve. Uh, now, if you're familiar with uh, that famous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's that passage in the Bible where the Apostle Paul talks about the church as like a, a body, right, with Jesus Christ as the head. And he says that you and I, we are like all those different parts of the body, and we each have a different role to play. Uh, Paul says in that chapter that God has given each part of the body, that means you and I, he's given each of us a different manifestation of the Spirit for the common Good. Now, what that means is he's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us abilities to be able to serve one another for the building up of the body. And, and Paul explains in that chapter with that metaphor of the body that every single person in the church, every single person who belongs to the body of Christ has a role to play. Everyone is absolutely crucial. There's no one who is disposable. And so if you want to summarize what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, basically says, it's this. It's that in the church, everybody is somebody. Everybody is somebody. Nobody is a nobody in the church of Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 says. And so what I want to just, just launch off that from is with one quick implication of that from this kind of thumbnail sketch of 1 Corinthians 12. I think one of the implications of that piece of theology is that everybody in the church has a job to do, right? Would you agree that that's not jumping to a conclusion here? That's just paraphrasing, really, what the Apostle Paul says. 100% of us, every part of the body, has a job to do. And it's a unique job that, jo that God has uniquely gifted each one of us 
for. Now, um, back in 2011, sorry, 2012, you might remember there was the, the Sandy Hook uh, school shooting massacre in the US. Uh, incredible tragedy. Uh, you might remember after that happened, that the authorities had to kind of publicly on radio and TV uh, ask people to stop sending resources to Sandy Hook, this tiny little town, because there were just mountains of teddy bears and flowers and well wishes and gifts and all that sort of stuff that people from all over the country were sending to try and help this tiny little community in the wake of this tragedy. Uh, similarly, back in 2011, after the Japanese tsunami and the earthquake, uh, there were all these stories about uh, how aid agencies and volunteer centres and things just had to close their doors and turn away hordes of people because there were more people volunteering at that time than they knew what to do with. They didn't have enough jobs for the people uh, to do. They didn't have enough rubber gloves and things. Now, can I say, we've never had that problem here at WBC. <laughs> We have never had to shut our doors and say, I'm really sorry, every job is done. There's nothing left for you to do here. Uh, we've never had an excess of volunteers at WBC. I don't know of any church that has, but can I tell you that I think every church should have that problem, right? Every church should have that problem because the cause of the gospel, more than any other cause in the world, even good causes like disaster relief, the cause of the gospel should be a cause that gets us up out of our seats, that gets us sit off sitting on our hands, that helps us to put our hands in the air and say, I'm here, I'll do something, what do you need me to do? The gospel should, should make that change in us. Now, WBC, look, we have never had an excess of volunteers. But here at the 6pm congregation, uh, we do have a lot of servants. We have an awful lot of servants, actually. Uh, you guys, as a congregation... Uh, as we've been thinking about this as pastors in the lead up to this series, uh, we want to tell you guys that we are super proud of you. We are super thankful for you because uh, you are a congregation that serves a lot. Uh, the statistics tell us that roughly 70% of you serve in some formal capacity here at WBC, which can I say that there are churches out there who would kill to have half that number uh, of a congregation serving. That is an incredible number, and we are so thankful to God for doing that amongst us, and we're thankful for you in doing that. Now, look, we, we would love to have 100%, not just 70% serving in some way, but look, we've been seeing that number grow steadily, and so we recognize that God is doing something amongst us here, making us a people who serve, and we want to acknowledge that, and we want to give thanks for that. Uh, we want to commend you, especially because that number, that 70% number, which is really the only number we can look at when it comes to this stuff, that doesn't include all of the ways that you guys serve other ministries, other parts of God's kingdom outside of WBC. It can't factor that in. And it can't factor in all of the countless informal ways that you guys serve one another as well, by ministering to one another, praying for our ministries, having that, that ministry of presence where you just show up to stuff and you attend prayer meetings and business meetings and whatever else. It can't factor any of that in. And so that's what makes that 70% number all the more special. You guys are killer servants. We are really stoked about that. And we don't want to take for granted all of the time and the energy that you guys pour into WBC, into God's work here. We want to thank you for that. You have really helped make this congregation a congregation of spiritual contributors, not a congregation of spiritual consumers. That's the culture here at 6pm. Uh, we roll up our sleeves and we get to work. We contribute and we don't kick up our feet and relax. And can I say that that is one of, I think, the most attractive things about our church. Uh, we are a church that is not afraid of putting our money where our mouth is, if you like. And that sends a message to the world that we believe in what we're doing. We believe in this cause of the gospel. We believe that God is so worthy of our time that, of course, we're going to give to support and resource the things that we say are important. And so God bless you guys for doing that. Genuinely, we really mean that. We are so thankful for it. Uh, but I, I do want to say at the same time that we don't just want to assume as a church, we don't want to become complacent and think that that culture is just going to be here forever. It's something that we've got to maintain, we've got to work on to make sure we are a group of spiritual contributors. Uh, because serving is not always easy, is it? If you are one of that 70%, you know that there's a cost involved in being a servant, in giving up things, sacrificing for the cause of the gospel. 
Uh, you ask anyone who's in that 70%, and they will tell you being a servant often means giving up something you love, something good, for something that you love more, and something that's actually more important. Uh, there are people in this church, you look around, they're everywhere, who make that decision weekly, who give up something they love for something they love even more. And so, look, I just want to celebrate some of those people with you tonight. I want to embarrass some of these people here at church. Uh, there are so many legends in this church who pay an incredible price to serve us and to serve God. Michael Lepke sitting over there is one of our deacons at church. He is one of the most godly and qualified men that I know. His time is worth a lot of money. And yet, he serves our church by being the deacon for our property here at WBC. What that means is that he does jobs that are well below his pay grade here. He fixes things. He he makes this place serviceable for us so that we can get on with the ministry that is happening here. He is a faithful attender and he supports all of our initiatives here. He shows up to more meetings than he really needs to show up for. And he does that at a cost because he works long hours. He has a pregnant wife and yet he is here serving God week in, week out. God bless you, brother. Uh, Amy Parsons over here. Amy has just taken on our KMC role uh, for looking after our children's ministry in the morning service, not her home service, the 10.30 a.m. service. She's taken on uh, the responsibility with Matt Innes, I don't know if Matt's here tonight, he is here, uh, to oversee a team of a lot of Sunday school teachers who are working to, to teach the gospel to the young people here at WBC. It's a big task. And you know why it's even harder for Amy? It's because she's a new mum. And by doing this work, she's giving up time with her new daughter, Eliana. God bless you, Amy, for making that sacrifice. Annie. Annie here, singing up on stage. Uh, Annie is an absolute legend because you know why? Annie works six days a week. She works six days a week and then she comes to church on Sunday twice. Not once, twice. She comes here in the morning to serve at our kids' ministry and then she comes back at night to sing and to labour and to bless us here as a church. She gives up the one day of the week that she could sleep in to come to church and to be with God's people and to move that gospel ball forward. Look, that's three people. There are countless more. There are countless legends like that in our church who make sacrifices and who understand that it is an honour to serve Christ and his church. These are the people who know and who truly believe what Jesus promised when he said that anybody who will leave houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. There is a cost to serving this way, but it's worth it. God's mission is worth it. And so let me just ask you here, do you know how you're going to serve at WBC this year? If you are a regular here, if WBC is your home, how are you going to serve? We believe that God wants every single person who's a regular here, who calls WBC their home, to be involved in some way. Do you know what that way is for you? If you do, then great. God bless you guys. Be fruitful in your ministry this year. We pray that you will be blessed. If you don't know the answer to that question, you don't know how you're going to serve tonight, that's okay. But can I say that tonight would be a great night for you to start figuring out the answer to that question. Perhaps the best way that you could do that would be to go and have a conversation with either Dan Page or Sarah Rodwell. I haven't seen Sarah. Is she here tonight? I don't think she is. Come and have a conversation with Dan Page. He uh, serves on our 6pm service committee, which is a group of members here at 6pm who exist to support us as a congregation. Uh, Dan, his role is to help people get plugged in to service opportunities. And so if you don't know how to serve, you don't know what your gifts are, you don't know what opportunities are out there, can I say, go and have a conversation to Dan at dinner. He'd be very pleased to start pointing you in the right direction. Serving God's mission is the first way that you can resource God's mission. Look, the other way, quickly, because I've run out of time, is to say the second way you can resource God's mission is by giving. Uh, it is by giving financially to God's mission. Uh, the Bible says that giving financially to the work of the gospel, it's normal. It's a normal part of the Christian life, and actually more than that, it's an expected part of the Christian life. How you give actually reveals something about the state of your heart because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And so the Bible says that Christians should give. It's expected. 
The Bible also says that actually the dollar amount that you give is really kind of inconsequential. What you were to give is a proportion of your income. And you've got to understand that God, God sees our hearts. He knows what we're basing this decision on. He sees our hearts. He sees our bank statements. He sees our Centrelink statements. He knows our financial affairs. And what God wants you to do is to be generous and to be cheerful and to give in proportion to what you are able that's what the Bible says about giving. And so what I want to do here tonight is just to urge you to consider doing that, if you don't do that already here at WBC. This church is, is packed full of very generous people. Uh, we have, especially in this last few months, we've been in a season uh, where we have excelled in the grace of giving, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, our church has met some incredible financial needs over these last three months, and we just kind of want to celebrate those wins with you tonight. So three quick wins that we want to tell you about, and thank you, for your role in. Uh, firstly, we stood up here about two or three months ago and we told you uh, that we were about $15,000 behind budget as a church, which was a pretty alarming kind of number for us at the point of the year that we were in at that stage. Uh, we are stoked to be able to tell you that as of today, we are a little bit more recently, we are no longer behind budget. Uh, you, God's people, have supplied uh, what was lacking. So our ministry doesn't need to slow down. We are so thankful for that. That is an incredible mercy of God through you guys to the church, to his kingdom. Uh, that's one incredible win. Second incredible win, uh, you've already heard a little bit about it today. Uh, towards the end of last year, we sent off a number of short-term mission trips. Uh, we provided for a number of projects with our gospel partners overseas. And all of those targets that we were aiming to hit, we hit. And those groups and those people were able to be sent and the work of the gospel was able to be advanced in many different corners of the world. We are so thankful that ours is a church that wants to give money away and wants to send blessing to, to other Christians who need it. Thank you for what you've done there. A third really great win that we're so, so excited about as well. Uh, we told you that we've just employed Chris Rothwell to, as a ministry intern here two days a week. Uh, this was a prayer, uh, this was a need that uh, we uh, particularly launched to you guys as a 6 p.m. congregation because Chris is one of your own and you rallied around him and so many generous people have sponsored him and have given to the cause of employing Chris to be trained here at WBC so that he can go and do gospel work. Uh, Chris has actually exceeded uh, the target that we set for him to be able to uh, work here two days a week and so God willing, there's a possibility somewhere down the line this year we might be able to employ him three days a week. That's an incredible gift from God and we want to thank you guys for that, for the way that you have been kind and generous in this cause. We are so thankful. And look, as much as uh, we've been in a season of incredible blessing, again, we don't want to take this for granted, right? Uh, we want to urge you to remember and, and really truly believe the words of the Lord Jesus that it's more blessed to give to, than to receive. We want to be a church for years to come that is marked by radical generosity, by incredible sacrificial giving to the cause of the gospel because you probably know there are some incredible gospel opportunities right on our doorstep here as a church. You know, God willing, we want to plant another church in the Illawarra sometime in the next few years. God willing, we want to raise up and send more homegrown missionaries to take the gospel to places where Christ has never been known. God willing, we want to employ more ministry interns so that we can train up and release the next generation of gospel workers here. There are so many incredible opportunities we have, really, right at our doorstep, but they, they're only going to be able to be realised if we continue to excel in the grace of giving. And so, church, can I call you tonight uh, to commit to that, please? If, uh, if you're here tonight and WBC is your home and uh, you do not give... Uh, to church, then look, there's probably a chance you're listening to this part of the talk and feeling rather guilty. Uh, I know what it was like as a young guy uh, to be in church and to hear calls to give financially and to feel like my giving was sporadic or not up to scratch. I knew in my heart uh, that I wasn't giving what I should have been giving. And that made me restless and uncomfortable and guilty. And I want to acknowledge that there's probably people who feel like that tonight. And if that's you, then can I say that I think what's going on is that God is is pressing onto your heart and saying, live with integrity here. If you say you believe the gospel, then put your money where your mouth is. Open your wallet. If, uh, if you do want to consider how to do that, prayerfully, 
then what I'd ask you to do is grab one of these little brochures. It explains how to give, why to give, where your money goes at WBC. Uh, they're just out there on the notice board. You can grab one at dinner. Uh, don't feel ashamed of grabbing one. No one's going to be judging you, thinking, oh, that's a person who doesn't give. They need to figure out what to do. No, we're stoked if you want to come and join with us in financial partnership with the gospel. Uh, grab one of these. It'll explain a little bit more about it. So, look, I'm well out of time. What I want to do, just as I finish, is just to remind you that whether it is through our service uh, here at WBC, whether it is through our financial giving, or whether it's through any other way that God is calling us to, to resource his mission, church, I want to remind you that we can trust God with this. We can trust God when we make these sacrifices, when we give up things for the sake of the gospel. Let me read to you this incredible promise from Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Paul writes, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Our God is good. He is generous. He will give us all things in Christ. His mission is worth the sacrifice. And so, friends, please join us in resourcing that mission. Let's pray together. Generous God, your grace to us in the Lord Jesus is so beyond comprehension that you would give such a precious gift to such unworthy people. God, please, would you help us to be gripped by your grace in the gospel? Help us to be people who are so captured by this, this mission to see your name known and worshipped worldwide that we would stand up and we would say, here I am, Lord, take me. Lord, please use us. Please use everything that is in our lives. It is already yours. And so, God, please do a work in us by your Spirit that we would continue to be a servant-hearted, generous church, a church who wants to give everything that we can for the sake of the gospel because, Lord, we know you are worth it. We know you are trustworthy. So, Lord, please change us. Conform us to the image of your Son, we pray, for his great name's sake. Amen. Um, I'm not sure about you guys, but sometimes I feel like I don't have very much to offer God. Um, I'm sure there are uni students.